second shift and he wants to apologize for the planning commission because he's unable to attend in person um, but he did get me his cell phone if you guys do have any questions and I can call him up and um, he'll be able to answer anything that you have particularly over the phone. Brian Sumner is the owner of property at 1609 East Elbridge Avenue. He would like to build a detached garage and lot and this by itself does not require condition use permit but his desire to build one that exceeds 120 square feet. Consideration for conditional use permit must go before the planning commission if the detached garage exceeds 720 square feet. His proposed garage is 40 by 50 or 2,000 square feet. Uh, I know this was published in the city newspaper to inform anyone who would be interested in this case and a letter was sent out to all the property owners within 200 feet of the property as is required. Uh, no one has shown concern and most people when they called, uh, I think the letter they received was about their property so there was some general confusion there and then they have some follow-up questions, and in which case, they don't care. And so that's pretty much it. Under Article 6.100.B1, off-street parking and loading spaces, as regulated by Article 5 of these regulations, include detached garages and carports. On lots are single and two-family dwelling units. All types of manufactured mobile homes. Such structures may contain incidental space for storage and other uses and are limited to one each per zoning lot, not over 720 square feet in gross floor area, for the garage and 400 for the carport, unless it initially is, is approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals for the large structure. So that's where this comes into play for conditional use permits if you would approve it for a detached garage. This is facing north. So this is, uh, came um, from the home builder on behalf of the homeowner. 
Um, so north is taken this way. The current property is right here. The current garage is right here. And there's going to be a um, uh, proposed driveway and then a detached garage right here. So you can see it's staying out of the easements, and there is a gap there between him and, and the other property. So he's meeting all the setback requirements, and he's staying out of the easement. Is this two separate buildings or one? One. Okay, the, the other garage is attached to the house. Correct. Okay. Uh, I spoke with him over the phone just to get some clarity on what kind of building he would be building. Um, he said brick facade, wood siding, wood frame, cement base, and a height of 14. So this is going to be, um, I, was, I don't know if you would call it traditional or more of an upscale type of detached garage because he's spending a lot of money to try to make it match his current, his current house. And it is in Elkridge, so obviously the lots are bigger. And there are other examples of detached garages that are in excess of 720 square feet in that current subdivision already. But this one is not going to be a traditional um, corrugated steel building. It's going to be a more um, aesthetically pleasing one. Uh, ancillary financial, there is none. And legal is approved in form. Recommendations and actions. It is recommended that the Planning Commission approve the initial use permit for the detached garage at 1609 East Elkridge Avenue. And I'll open up for questions, comments, or concerns. The lot coverage is okay? Yes, there's okay. plenty. Good. So perhaps you're right. I, don't know. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize that RVs was a social status symbol. And then everyone's got RVs, three boats, and a, and a shops, toys. Know. Yeah, so I, it may be right. Um, that might be a consideration if the planning commission wants to amend subdivision regulations to change it from 720 to. Uh, I, I don't know. It would be reasonable. 50. <laughs> didn't you say that 1,200 works? Yeah, we we talked about this at one point. Yeah, that changed me. To 1200. How many of these do we get a year? I mean, I mean, it, that too. It is, I guess, as we're building more subdivision, subdivision, that may be more. 1200, we would cut this one, but. <laughs> no, no, but it makes sense. I mean, you know. Yeah. The material works for 1200. Yeah. 10 by 12. Well, two two car garage is about six hundred twenty five. So we were, I mean, it's seven fifty, seven twenty. Uh, most of the attached garages I've seen are six forty, six hundred forty square yeah. feet. That's a that's a two so, car garage yeah. size. So twelve eighty, twelve eighty would be. I don't know, a garage. <laughs> that's an accessory to well, your garage. Yeah, two cars that would be what twenty four by thirty inch, twenty four by twenty four. Yeah. yeah, right? 20 by 20. Okay, what well, about a three 20. car garage? Yeah. Oh. But you know, that, that number never seems to matter. To me, it's lot coverage. It's all about lot yeah, coverage. Yeah, we do have that. I mean, for runoff and all that, mm -hmm. that is, you know, way more important than, you don't want to drive into a town of roofs, is why, you know, yeah. zoning, that's why that management that's why has, right. yeah, why we came up with all of this is mm -hmm. so that, you know, <coughs> you didn't have hard surface everywhere. Right, right. So mm -hmm. it's really that percentage of lot coverage. And can you remember off, right offhand what the lot coverage, did? no, no. percentage? <laughs> I could look it up though. I checked it before just to make sure, but I don't remember. Yeah. Um, I think you said it last time, but I couldn't. Yeah. 
Could that be part of the requirement? What's that? The lot coverage? It's a requirement right now that you can't exceed a certain lot coverage. So it's like 35% or something like that. You can't exceed 35%. Okay. So we wouldn't even be seeing it if it no. exceeded no. that. No. I don't know. I mean, I guess not really talking about it. I mean, 720 is a two car drive. 24 by 30. Yeah. Well, so an average lot is like a third of an acre, which would well, be about 15,000. Right. 15, yeah. Quarter? Quarter is most of our, yeah. Quarter, so 45,600. 11,400, so that's 11,400 square feet would be the average lot in like in the city? Yeah. Yeah. Quarter, quarter acre is, is traditional. The, I would say about 8% of lots in Goddard are, are quarter acre. A third of an acre is. That's big. what Wichita is. I thought, I thought. It's very traditional. Yeah. When you have a subdivision, quarter acre lots are very traditional. They only start to vary when you get to the cul de sacs and then they start having those pie shaped mm -hmm. uh, third of an acre lots. And then you have the larger lot subdivisions that are platted that way, like um, or we're off of Leo Circle or Elk Ridge where the lots are larger. Where they're going to have, you know, um, oh. three quarters of an acre, or half an acre. That kind of thing. Okay. So with, so a quarter of that then would be, or no, thirty-five percent of that would be about four thousand square foot. So the house and the accessory. Mm -hmm. So if you have a two thousand, yeah. So you could have a twenty-five hundred well, square foot out, a fifteen hundred yeah, square foot garage, and that would be, that would kind of fit into. Um, our lot coverage. Yeah, I'm, I'm just just a scenario, but well, there are some pretty small lots too. I mean, we have to be reasonable too because it's, um, in more traditional Goddard, the lots are very small. I was going to say, and because I'm over on Pine, and yeah. I've got a double lot, and it's a quarter of an acre. Right, so, but uh, most of Old Goddard was planted in 1886. Yeah, those lots were 1,500 square feet. They were huge. Oh, yeah, the fire, I mean, <laughs> they were very small. I don't remember you. <laughs> yeah, they were, I mean, when it was platted back in 1886, it was very, very small, very skinny lots. And this is kind of the same thing when we saw over at 301 East First Avenue, who also on that condition was parked for the detached garage. Yeah, there was one lot that was very skinny, and then in 1980, someone bought another lot, and then it was, you know, at that point, once they had bought a second lot, it was up to about a third of an acre once they combined the two lots. And then there was a third lot that he added together and it became a half acre. But that was not, that one, yeah, you don't see a lot of those now, but you do see a lot of lots thrown together. And that kind of came up before with the um, um, 227 Cedar, that question about do we need to um, um, erase that boundary line because those two lots were still there. So lot one, lot two, and there's mm -hmm. no boundary line. So I had to, you know, Call Wichita. We were talking back and forth about it. And I was talking to the surveyor and, and found out that they had already been put together on the zoning, so it was already set at that point. Mm -hmm. But a lot of those smaller lots have already been, you know, uh, bound with another one. Moving forward. Moving forward. Old business none. New business there are none. Staff report. Residential growth, the city of Goddard continues to grow. And as of right now, Elk Ridge has 15 lots left for sale. Arbor Creek has sold 20 lots in phase one, and Clover Leaf has pulled four building permits. Um, I wanted to go ahead and show you this. I don't know if you're able to see that. It's also on your agenda packet. Basically, um, St. Andrews is fully packed out right now. There's no more lots for sale. Spring Hill is completely packed out. There are no more lots. Seasons is done. Uh, so Hopper is all done. Arbor Creek has 20 that has sold, um, and Elkridge has only got 15 left. Clover Leaf has begun to start selling, and Russell Creek is in the process right now. So we're at a, we're moving at a very um, healthy pace. Um, every year, I contact the Wichita Area Builders Association and kind of check um, who's like how many building permits are being pulled per city based on the population as a ratio. And last year, we were winning; we were number one in the Lava region for building permits to population. So we were, uh, first we were, in July we were fourth, we were behind 
Bel Air, Rose Hill, and Derby. And then by the end of the year in December, we were number one. So our building permits are flying, and we are moving really fast, especially with residential development. It's commercial is still kind of on the uptick. There's small businesses that are starting to come forward and want more um, to build and continue, but residential just is, is exploding right now. Cedar Mission, uh, on March 11, 2019, the Planning Commission approved the final plan for the Cedar Mission, which is between Main Street and Cedar. Uh, I believe the developer is moving forward with building the five types, and we should see building per permits being pulled shortly. This kind of surprised me because obviously this was back in March of last year, and I didn't know what was going on because they had, we had approved the plat, and then the developer was just sitting on it, nothing was happening. And then uh, finally, Bothman Company reached out and said, hey, uh, we don't traditionally do this, but we're going to start pulling the building permits on behalf of the developer. So that happened. So I went ahead and emailed them the building permits. So they're going to be pulling them out and sending them in. But if you remember, Main Street and Cedar is right here, and there's those quadplexes. There's, I think, three or four of them, four quadplexes right there. And on the back side, they have a private drive, and there's going to be four duplexes and then one facing Cedar. So that was... Um, but we're finally going to see these ones to be built. Goddard Outdoor Power, this is the one we talked about a little bit. Uh, Goddard Outdoor Power has submitted a request for a sign guidance so they can have additional wall signs on their business. The notice was sent out to the city newspaper and letters were sent out to everyone within 200 feet. <coughs> this kind of goes back to the sign regulations. You can only really have one of each type of sign. Um, I worked with them as much as I could, but really the definition, by the definition of what they were submitting, they, were, they wanted five wall signs. There was no way around it. There could only be one, one classification that was wall sign. And since we could only allow one, I denied them that and said you can only have one wall sign, so they picked one. And I said, but you can take it before the planning commission if you want and request a sign variance to have more than one wall sign, which is allowed in the subdivision regulations. So you'll be seeing them in September. Uh, Baptist Church, so some of you know this, maybe some of you don't, but the Goddard Baptist Church is for sale. Several different people have already talked to four, uh, are looking at purchasing the property, and they want to know basically what the rezoning re um, requirements are and how long that takes, because I guess that's part of the sale. And I don't know what the deal is with that, but it's apparently the sellers want part of it to be rezoned if somebody would purchase it. And so different people are asking, well, if I do this, if I have condos, or if I do this, and we had, you know, teenagers for, you know, um, colleges, or if we did this, you know, so there's, there was a whole gamut of different types of requests for land uses for that church. Um, you know, what would be required? What kind of zoning would be allowed? How, how does the rezoning process work? And, and so I explained it to all of them. And I believe at some point, somebody's gonna buy that, and they're gonna want it, they're gonna need to rezone it. So I'm letting you know on the front end that at some point somebody's going to want to rezone that church. There's three lots. There's one. There's two lots that are on Main Street. One of them's got a sign. One of them's empty. Those are a central business district. They're zoned central business district. The church is technically R1. It's zoned R1, and there's that little um, I don't know what you would call it, little convention center right next to it. That's also on the same lot. It's all R1. So if anyone was going to do multifamily, it would have to be R3. Uh, if somebody was going to do offices, that would have to be general business or central or central business, and so they're going to have to rezone that. So at some point, we're probably going to somebody's going to bring a rezoning application before the planning commission for that church. Cloverleaf sign variance. So the developer who's building Cloverleaf wants to put a larger than allowed marketing sign. This is similar to Arbor Creek. Um, the development wanted to a larger than marketing sign for advertising their subdivision. So the same thing is happening at Cloverleaf. They have. A, they wanted to build, uh, I think they wanted a 96 square foot marketing sign. Um, I said no, because technically our, our sign regulations dictate that for an R2 zoning classification, you can only have 16 square feet. And so they're going through, they've also submitted a sign variance um, to go through and get an above average marketing sign similar to the Arbor Creek subdivision. So they'll be here also in September to petition the planning commission to ask for a sign variance. Um, this is not actually on the staff report, but I'll bring it up. I've been talking to the new architects for Bronze, and we were going back and forth about the sign, and it is um, it has come to my attention after we kind of rehashed it out that their sign variance for their, for their sign has expired. 
it's only allowed 180 days. Um, at the 180 day mark, they can petition the planning commission <clears throat> to extend it, but they never did. So since they never did and it's exceeded 180 days, Brahms is gonna have to come back before the planning commission to ask for a sign variance for their sign for Brahms. So just to let you know, I don't know when they're gonna do that, but they have the application, I email them everything they need. At this point, we we'll move on to item J, planning commission comments. No, we were shaking our head. <laughs> I got something. Wasn't that part of Brahms's thing? Their sign had to be so tall before they were. Thirty-five feet. How much was it? Thirty-five feet. I was thinking there was something why they had to get a sign variance to begin with. Because they're way over. They were going to be ice cream cone. Yeah. What got approved is taller than the Walmart sign. Yeah. yeah. Wow. We got that time to come back to it. The one down on. The other one's not that tall. Is it just because it's on tell us? Yes. And that's not the actual like neon part of it or whatever that is like the bigger Not part. that I know, I'm aware of. When I was, when I was, when I was reading the minutes, that I think it was simply the, the height. And it's, I think that was the only variation they wanted was the height that they could see because <clears throat> under, I think currently on a, on a commercial district, 25 feet is max. But they want, I don't, I think they want 35, 35, 35 feet. feet. <laughs> so that exceeds the height restrictions. <laughs> And it's a pylon, so it's like, <laughs> and then the ice cream cone. So this is going to be round two. Uh, now look at the money they're losing since they didn't do it yet. Every day when I come home, I look over there and that ball field just full of color. Oh, I know. Oh, yeah. And the dairy queen's out in the street. Yeah. <laughs> no more comments than I know of. Everybody's, are we done? Are we looking for a motion then? Are, are we done? We're done with this. Hint, hint. I'll make a motion to be here. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.